I think it's an occupational hazard of, of this time of our lives that many of us have been in a number of um, Zoom or Teams retirement tribute events. And Maggie and my greatest desire was to avoid <laughs> that format. <laughs> But you know, we so, appreciate it. But oh, we, we so much appreciate it. We so much appreciate it. What everyone has said is just lovely, lovely. Um, but but you know, our our hope was to 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 change the format mm -hmm. and really just um, do and do this together um, and and really just have a conversation. And um, and I guess I made the suggestion that we might kind of organize the conversation by thinking about the very first thing we ever published and then thinking about the the most recent thing we ever published or maybe work in, in progress and think about the um, the relations between those, um, the continuities, the the changes in direction, the loops, the, the whatever. Like so that's it. kind of this, that's this kind of what we did. The discontinuities in my case, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a good idea. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> it was a good idea. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh and 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 also we we um were trying really, really hard not to prepare, which of course is very hard after decades and decades of you know preparation for performances. Um so so I tried really not to hard not to prepare. I made some notes which I'm not going to look at. Um <laughs> But but yeah so so uh, yeah Maggie I think you should you should start Seriously. us yeah I thought you might say that <laughs> you know Lucy said okay the first thing you ever published right and then maybe the last thing and of course for me there's just been a a process of staggering from one thing to another driven I think by I suppose my background as a, a newspaper reporter and 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 it came out during this wonderful summer school we've all just finished which Israel was a part of and Maureen was part of and Vicky was running and we, Claire was we were all together and it suddenly struck me that I've been driven like from pillar to post really all my life following the news and there's that thing that you learn when you're a journalist that, you know, there's the news, you have to jump and follow and go to something. And uh, I think that's probably influenced the enormously erratic nature of, of my academic career, which I don't think has any logic or thread to it at all. But perhaps <laughs> others would disagree, which would be very nice. But anyway, so Lucy came up with this idea and I thought, OK, I'm going to show you something that goes right back to 1989 and which is when I was still a newspaper reporter, a journalist. So I'm, I'm going to share my screen and I hope you can see this. And I'm going to go into this window. And I hope you can see this. And can everybody see this or do I have to go into presenting? Yeah, yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes, yes. I'll explain it, right? So, <laughs> This was this was one of I was a very I was a junior reporter and um, uh, the the headline is appalling. But I can only explain that because the chief sub who wrote the headlines hated me. <laughs> and um, the story goes like this, that the, the city of Lancaster, for those of you who know Lancaster, in the 80s, there was a massive plan to pull a lot of the city centre down and build it up again. And I discovered that there was a company that owned some quarries where I live, because I live 20 miles from Lancaster, that was owned by another company called, a huge company called Consolidated Gold Fields, which was a British a mining company mining gold in started off mining gold in South Africa and the company that was going to redevelop the city centre of Lancaster was owned by this company it's it was a, a wholly owned subsidiary of consolidated gold fields and uh, I came into this 
this story kind of halfway through of the of the city centre redevelopment. But I suddenly discovered through contacts I had locally here up in you know North Yorkshire that it was it was this company that that owned the uh, develop developers of the city centre. The very controversial plan to uh, pull bits of the city centre down, very old bits, and cover them with concrete. So anyway, um, what do I do with this piece of information? And the the council had supported the project. Everyone had agreed it. There was going to be a public inquiry over the details, but basically it was a done deal. They hadn't actually signed it. And so uh, I had to kind of pretend that um, others had found the story because, I mean, I was quite exposed by this story. Anyway, um, you can see from the story that um, I managed to get hold of a, a councillor in the um, Lancaster City Council who was also a lay preacher. And at that time, the churches were supporting the sanctions against the apartheid regime in South Africa. And this was at the pinnacle of the struggle, really, of uh, towards the end of the struggle. You know, in 1985-86, sanctions had been agreed, even though Thatcher was trying to you know, ignore them. And lots of companies like this company were trying to um, hide their connections with the apartheid regime. Um, so, so this particular councillor was caught in a kind of uh, a kind of headlock, really, over this story when I phoned him up because he was a lay preacher and a councillor and couldn't, in conscience, support any more association with this this company. Anyway, I'm taking up a lot of time, but but this story um, resulted then in the uh, collapse of the whole project. And uh, eventually, you know, the, the the company actually went bust anyway. But um, I mean, there's a story from the following week um, in which the, the, you know, the council is lobbied by the anti-apartheid group locally. And, you know, it's 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 just a kind of moral dilemma that faced them. But, yeah, it was the end of the redevelopment. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Just have to figure out how get back into this okay I'm not sharing any more screens yeah. <laughs> okay. that was a good one <laughs> yes yeah, so that was yeah I was just very young and that was my one of my first stories so so I guess should I go to my first yeah, and yeah. then we'll go then we'll we'll fast forward um um yeah so okay well I'll I'll, uh, I'll do a quick um screen share just to show you, um, I, I've got a, actually a, a little slide here with um, both of, of my first and in progress <laughs> papers. So I read that today, your 1983 piece that you're going to share. I just, this is I've coming just read. Up. Yeah. The wheels of computation are turning here. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> slowly, the wheels of computation turn slowly. <laughs> okay, here we are. So, okay, so it's the it's on uh, on the left is the um, my very first publication. Uh, in it was in a it's in a journal called Transactions on Office Information Systems. Very very flashy title. Um, and this was in 1983, I believe. So I hadn't um, yet uh, completed my dissertation. Um, and in fact, my dissertation, you know, went off in, in a somewhat different direction. Um, but the, basically, I was, um, I had gone uh, to, I, I ended up at Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center um, somewhat, um, I, I had been looking for a place to study uh, corporate power. Um, and I think here's one of the connections, Maggie, because I think we've both um, always been interested in um, thinking about corporate power in its enactments, its its sort of mundane everyday enactments. And and my you know initial thought was I wanted to do 
a, a, a PhD project that would look at at how corporate power reproduces itself basically through through everyday um, mundane activities. Um, so I by by a, a circuitous route of connections, I ended up um, at this place, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which turned out to be a, a, a research center um, developing um, computer systems. Uh, and in particular, at that point, the sort of shift towards the the um, mini computer from from mainframes. Um, and so, you know, the rest is history. I got sort of drawn into issues of technology. Um, and, you know, one of the things that that I've always been fascinated by is how people engaged in technological projects um, understand, um, figure, imagine the domains uh, for which they are designing. So in this case, I landed um, as, a, as a, a research intern, as they were called it, at Xerox Park, um, PhD students basically looking, you know, to do their projects. I landed in this group called the Office Research Group, which lasted for a year and not, and then got disbanded. So that was, you know, also a, an early um, introduction to corporate reorganization. <laughs> and uh, but in any case, I was in this group called the Office Research Group, and here were computer scientists who were interested in office automation and um, office automation. At that point, they'd kind of picked off the. Uh, you know, they they taken care of payroll processing and and various kinds of um, aspects of of office um, office work that were easily translatable um, into sort of database um, uh, based uh, computer systems. And now they wanted to sort of move out um, into uh, this was kind of the emergence of knowledge work as well as a trope. Um, so th these folks were doing they were modeling. Um, office work. And of course, their models were entirely in terms of information flows. Um, and so they would basically take, you know, procedures, uh, formulations of procedures, whether they were in manuals or or by talking to people, and they would map them as, as information flows. And then that would be the basis for developing um, a, a, a computer system that would automate those um, those flows of information. So my intervention was to try to, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to look at the most supposedly routine office work, the, the for, forms of office work that should lend themselves so nicely <laughs> to automation, right? And so um, as a kind of pilot project, I went to the accounting office at Xerox Park, um, where they were doing things like processing expense reports, um, accounts payable, and so forth. Um, and I was I was very inspired at the time um, by ethnomethodology, and uh, so I I basically spent time um, really looking closely at what these folks in the in the uh, accounting office did, uh, and then basically um, made the the argument first in this paper um, that um, rather than office procedures being specifications, which of course computer scientists loved the idea that procedures are just like, you know, they're algorithmic, basically. Um, so routine work is kind of ready made for automation because it's all just procedural and, you know, you automate the procedures and, and you're done. Um, so basically the argument that I made was that um, office procedures don't tell people how the work gets done. They tell people what it should look like in the end. So basically the work of people in the accounting office was to, you know, get things paid get people reimbursed, get bills paid, but very importantly, to create records of that that showed that those things had been done according to the procedures. And creating those records um, was in no, the procedures said nothing about that, basically. The procedures were a referent and the work was to make a document of what had happened that was that could be read as having an accountable relation to the procedure. Because the, the idea was that, you know, at any moment, an auditor might come into the office, open a file drawer, everything was done on paper at this point, um, you know, pull out a, a, a record at random and inspect it and be able to inspect it as a, a record that was of, of an, uh, a record of an event that went according to the procedure. So there's, you know, I tried to unpack all of that work that the procedural, the procedures presupposed, but in no way specified. And in that way to sort of 
I guess, try to blow up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I mean, it was published in Transactions on Office Information Systems. And, you know, that was because there was one, you know, very, very sweet person who was an editor of the journal who learned about the work that I was doing and just really held my hand through putting okay. this this paper together. And, um, yeah, so that's the first one. And then Lucy, can I say something about that paper? Please, just, please, Maggie, say something. I, yeah, because the nature of this this conversation, right? I can see in that paper from 1983 so much of what you later went on to do. So much, and and yet, it, I mean, it's very different, you know, in style. But do you know what the the thing that really resonated with me when I read this today, and I've read lots of your work, but I hadn't read this one is that I immediately felt on the side of those, those accounts payable staff, those two <laughs> staff that you've got a transcript of, struggling to work out, work around, figure out what to do. And, you know, we see this when we observe people at work. And your work, all your work, has this kind of basic, and I've, I've used this word before, and it's probably over the top, compassion for people mm -hmm doing work. That's what I really liked about it. Well, I would say the same thing about you, Maggie. I think that that this is one of the very strong connecting threads um, across our work is 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 a is labor is yes. basically um, attention to to labor and to the systematic erasures um, of labor, uh, trivializations, translations, um, you know, betrayals. Uh, of labor that are involved in the development of technological systems. And, um, you know, just a couple of things. I mean, one is I kind of share your feeling like I have to say when I go back and read this paper from 1983, I'm a bit disconcerted because I feel like everything I think I thought up between then and now I'd already thought of then. <laughs> You know, yeah, I'm just yeah. sort of yeah. doing it over again in, in different ways. So that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. But the other thing is, and I'm, I'm just going to hold this up. This is Maggie's um, amazing book, Building the, the Trident Network. And I think this was, was this your PhD thesis? Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and so, you know, when I look at this book, it's all about, I mean, it's a classic STS project of, um, of, of, on, of opening up the contingencies in the, the this in, enormous technological and dreadful technological project um, in the UK, um, but also it's all about labor, um, and you know it's it's really the the um, trade unions that are the they are your interlock interlocutors, and and I think that's you know again that's. That's a very strong connection um, that 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 comes across our work. Um, and the other thing, I guess, that I, I I love about this book and that I think ties actually even more directly to the, the work that I'm doing now is that it is about um, the the let's say the inevitability of technological systems that they are not inevitable, but that things uh, get arranged in such a way discursively, um, politically, economically, that they take on a kind of naturalized, inexorable um, trajectory. And that's what's going on now in what I'm looking at in the the introduction of um, artificial intelligence into the, the U.S. Defense Department. Yeah, um, I mean, the, on the face of it, on the face of it, there's not so much in common between Trident and your, you know, your your current projects of of kind of you know the kind of robotic and automated and drone led warfare, but the inevitability of these things, you know, has stuck. I mean, th this is one of the questions I have for STS. You know, we do all these studies, pulling apart the inevitability, pulling apart these very strong trajectories of inescapability that get built around some of these systems. And I mean, Trident, you know, has been absolutely massive. Um, and yet they stick back together, you know. I mean, you know, how can we, <laughs> you know, how can we 
keep hope alive that you know mm -hmm. you know that our work will make a difference here i mean this is in this very recalcitrant and very difficult uh domains you know such as you know the the eternal war that is now being fought and you know the the kind of obscene and crazy adherence to huge systems of mass destruction that you know mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, there's another big, big connection for us is, is around militarism and, and anti-militarism and demilitarization. And, you know, you've you've done that in, in this project in solidarity with with workers. And, you know, there are very exciting tech worker coalitions emerging now as well. Um, you know, most famously Google's the Google workers who resisted um, Project Maven, which was this project to automate the analysis of, of, of video footage. Um, and, you know, so I think solidarity with those with those people um, who are struggling, you know, to sort of work from within to resist having their labor um, deployed in this way. I mean, in your case, it was also about um, the the, you know, this process of um, which it, which is also always going on of attempting to diminish um, labor costs and um, you know find ways and automation of course is all about that that's you know we can't be interested in automation without being interested in in labor um, and I guess the other strategy um, for for me is to try to articulate um, so for example you know when I said that I felt like I was still I was doing exactly the same thing. It, you know, yeah. so if I, I just go from root, routine office work to um, the automation of the identification of terrorists in the full motion video of a drone surveillance, um, you know, it is there are this, the same issues arise um, because in in the in the in both cases there is a fantasy that um, that the way that human intelligence, cognition, perception works is fundamentally computational. It's fundamentally algorithmic. And so if you can just model it adequately, then you can automate it. And so in the in the current case, the idea is that um, if if it's the case that all cognition cognition arises out of classification, um, categorization, uh, then all we have to do is build the models. Um, so, you know, we can go from building models that can differentiate between cats and dogs, um, you know, which of course is done through huge amounts of human labor, right? So you have, you crowdsource the categorization of images, and we're not even talking about cats and dogs, right? I mean, we couldn't get anywhere if we were just talking about cats and dogs. We have to have images of cats and dogs. And then we get lots of people to say cat, dog, cat, dog, cat, dog. And then we deploy this incredibly sophisticated machinery to figure out patterns that correlate with those human categorizations and can produce, you know, reliably differentiate between images of cats and dogs. And then we say the machine has learned to recognize cats and dogs, right? So this drives me crazy. And yeah. then when we think about, about substituting for cats and dogs, terrorists, um, you know, Al Qaeda uh, or ISIS affiliates, people who pose an imminent threat um, to the United States or its allies, um, you can imagine what does the model building for that look like, right? This, again, we're, we're working with images um, and, you know, this is basically discrimination at scale. That's, that's what, you know, that's how I think about um, algorithmic um, AI based data analysis. It's basically prejudicial discrimination at scale. Um, and you know, you say at one point um, in in the Trident book, you you say something about you remark about the ways in which these incredibly sophisticated technological systems are built on top of the kind of most retrograde, you know, crudest uh, orderings. Um, they're reproducing these 
long standing very, very problematic um, orderings. And, and, and I think that's what's going on right now. Um, well, what's going on AI. is a conversation with you is always therapeutic for me because <laughs> things don't make sense. Things, connections, I start remembering connections and I start feeling almost sane, you know, with the work that I, I've been doing. <laughs> and yeah, I think it's that uh, pushing aside, you know, so that the, a, a big story in the Trident book was a kind of weeping for creative and, and uh, non-military uh, technologies that were pushed aside Mm. And so you, when you say that, that you know, the, the Trident system is built on, you know, these very crude arguments, well, you know, those crude arguments prevailed. But what was what was marginalized, you know, is now actually coming back all kinds of wave power systems, wind power systems mm -hmm. that they had the ideas for and some of the prototypes for systematically obscured and marginalized so that we could do this make this monster you know yes. a lot of yes. a lot of the, the workers were very um very cut up about this and you know there were all kinds of compliments that were being made and uh you know so so that kind of automation and al algorithmic um trope that you've been following i suppose that's why i ended up looking at automated surgery or you know um mm -hmm algorithmic um, forms of knowing the body through telemedicine and you know right. substituting you know all kinds of and all the work all the labor all the you know incredible labor that went on to make those systems work right, and right. investments of the big business you know in in and all the rhetorics that get built around it i used your work so much in helping me think through all that stuff you know right and, doesn't it doesn't really relate to the trident stuff except when i talk to you it does <laughs> yeah and i've also used your work um with with celia uh and and others on um telecare and you know the these wonderful stories about how the supposed technicians who are just in there to configure the various sensors um, in, in people's homes that are then going to connect their everyday activities to the to the call center. I mean, and again there, it's modeling, right? It's traces yeah. of everyday activity that are computationally tractable that become the proxies for um, having some kind of connection to understanding of what's going on in people's homes. And then what you show is that the, the, the technicians who are supposedly just there to set up the tech, the kit, they become drawn into the work of care, the work of actually, um, you know, it, 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 as I recall, sort of both seeing what could possibly make sense in this person's home and what didn't make any sense at all, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, those are the people who see how things are actually made and and they're of course positioned as just being the implementers um, of something that has been you know conceptualized somewhere else um, which is the old mind body you know yeah, move yeah. that yeah that that's sure. absolutely crucial here um and all this links with the wonderful work you know of colleagues here and others about what is care it starts to open up yeah where is care how is care when is care yes you know, all that yeah. Yeah. Okay. So perfect lead into your most recent project, Maggie. Oh God. <laughs> okay. All right. So and, and you, you said you were going to give us some backstory. Yeah, backstories. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and I have colleagues here who help me with cuidar. Cuidar means to take care. We took care of each other. Otherwise, we'd have gone insane with that project. I mean, it was wonderful, wonderful project, and. The most recent publication is a joint effort, uh, uh, you know, between so many people. But, you know, co-editors here, Isra and Danny is all the way through this book as well. And um, but but the compromises that academic work involves. This is a, an amazing kind of case study of struggling mm -hmm. compromise right from the very beginning. And I'm sure Danny and, and, it, and you know, um, and Israel would agree that, you know, from the beginning, uh, 
you know, there were struggles over what counts as legitimate work. So from the very beginning, even though this project was funded by the European Commission, they couldn't understand why we wouldn't come up with a definition of disaster. You know, that it was an unscientific yeah. project because we had not defined our terms. Wow. And the whole basis of the project is we wanted the young people across Europe to say what counted as a disaster for them. You know, that they, they articulated the risks that they lived with, but somehow they it was not legitimate for them to actually define disaster. No, that's for scientists. Mm. So we had those those kinds of struggles. Um and and then we we had terrible struggles over you know things like GDPR, the, you know data protection and ethics, and we were yes. beaten up by you know people at the European Commission who were at trying to frighten us away from working with young people yes. because of you know, so-called ethical issues which we yes. had taken great care over, and they yes. were wrong. We, we we found out they were completely wrong but they undermined us and, and destroyed our confidence at various points. Yeah. And in the end, if it hadn't been for the young people, 500 young people that we worked with who came out with these amazing stories for us to build a, a young person's version of disaster management for Europe, we'd have, we'd have gone mad. And then right at the end, the compromise, you have to do all these deliverables for the European Commission. So this this idea of the academic as a kind of producer on this kind of production yes, like churning. Absolutely. We, we missed one of those dead, one of those um, publications. And so we had to pull together at the last minute a book and get a contract signed in order not to be penalised by wow. the Commission. And so what yeah. signed, we then had to write the wretched thing when we'd moved on to <laughs> other work and they had no money had to, you know so it really was a lesson in solidarity at the end that we managed to yeah I mean this is such a classic story Maggie of because so so this goes back to this question of the imaginaries of those who who uh you know who envision and fund of course deploy the resources for various kinds of projects um what they imagine uh we're going to deliver to them, yes. you know, and in this case, obviously, you're supposed to help deliver a system for the managerial rational control of disaster. And sure, if we can enroll kids in that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but but all of the problematics that you want to open up, starting with the question of what constitutes a disaster, we, we just came out of this wonderful summer school um, on uh, ecologies of emergency, where it was all about the question of who articulates that this is an emergency, who articulates that this is a disaster, who articulates the terms of its, you know, extent and 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 limits its its genealogies and you know and and who's called to respond in what ways. And and I think over the course of the week we we succeeded in sort of again kind of blowing that all up in in really, really generative ways. And and I, you know, just this question of being enrolled, I, I now I want to share a recent story because one of my struggles has been about um, the question, you know, I am I am an anthropologist um, by by degree and and many ways by affinity, and I deeply believe in the the that there are things that you can learn by being present um, that you can't learn in any other way. And so, what do I do in relation to the U.S. military? Right? I mean, I've spent my whole life trying to stay as far away from the U.S. military as possible. <laughs> So I'm really was troubled by this, you know. I'm 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 working at a kind of second a, a, a remove right now that 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 I that I'm uncomfortable with. So, so I I spoke at at an event a couple of years ago um, in New York at the a wonderful AI Now Institute, and afterwards um, a woman came up to me who was the head of of the of, of ethics at Microsoft. Um, and uh, she was very, you know, keen to involve me um, in some way in their projects. And shortly after that, um, I got an invitation. They were developing something called, well, it's a technology called the HoloLens, which is a, a head-mounted virtual reality display. And they have a contract with the Army. They've just, they've just delivered their first prototype and gotten a whole lot more money. So the idea is that frontline infantry 
are going to be sort of um, presented with this perfect situational awareness through the mediations of this head mounted display, right? This is like my horror story, you know, <laughs> materialized, right? So I get this invitation. Would I be willing to be an ethical advisor to that project? Um, and so I thought, first I thought this is really amazing. And then I thought ethnographic opportunity. Um, and so then I said, well, um, you know, can you tell me more about what the conditions would be of doing this? And um, the person who had emailed me said, well, this would be under blue tent conditions. And so I went and, you know, duck, duck, goad, blue tent. And, and I found President Obama, you know, on some front line in this blue tent. <laughs> and I discovered that blue tent means you you will never be able to say anything about it to anyone ever. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, that really doesn't work for me. <laughs> so so you know, I subsequently went down and was and was part gave a talk in it in a sort of open um, symposium at Microsoft, um, where you know I did my best. Um, but that issue of and, and all of the sort of incredible ethics washing that's going on right now, um, by, you know, in a lot of areas, but definitely within the U.S. Defense Department, there, uh, there is no way, I think, to participate in that without legitimizing it. And, you know, again, I was invited the, De the Defense Innovation Board, which is this dreadful sort of Silicon Valley DOD um, love, love fest. Um, you know, I was invited to to be part of a of a workshop to contribute to develop the development of, of the ethics guidelines which the defense innovation board delivered to the dod and i could not find a way into that conversation i mean everything that i wanted to talk about was outside the frame and so it's it, i just think this is a very interesting dilemma that 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 problem of compromise as you say how you how the opportunities that are presented, how you get enrolled in these projects, how we try to rework them as you've done, you know, very beautifully with Quidar, but so painfully, right? Because you're you're constantly sort of going against the framing that's been handed to you. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, the securitization of safety is the safety and security program. And we found that it was all about security. So I'd yes. go to the conferences and it was all about surveillance technologies and then just little old me or us talking about people, publics, you know, children, yeah. whatever. Yeah. But um, this takes me right back, right back again, right back to being a trainee reporter at college, you know, and one thing that was always said, you know, by, by we had very good training, I have to say. And one of the principles was to learn, learn the quality of the compromise you make that matters so that we, we're always making compromises and in that case you just spoke about compromise wasn't on the cards right but other times it is and, and it has to be and it's right what is the quality of that compromise is it is it worth it and I mean maybe that's a good point to to sort of bring bring everyone back in because yeah I think I, I think it is everyone struggles with this don't they yes exactly and I would say that my 20 years at Xerox Park were a, an exercise in in comprom trying trying to compromise without losing one's integrity <laughs> and um you know it's always it's always a bit of a shabby compromise <laughs> in the end <laughs> How is, but, how is everyone getting on with this? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I I'm with you, Maggie. I think it's time to to you know reopen this to to all of our friends here. 